Hi, I'm Matt Hill. I'm the curriculum designer here at MRU, and this is a walkthrough slides video for day one of our price ceilings and price floors um, new unit plan. And so with these videos, we're just trying to give you an idea of what we were thinking um, when we conceptualized, you know, the lesson plan for the day. All right, so this is day one, price ceilings. So our bell ringer, we're just going to ask sort of a simple question giving the students a price ceiling, although you don't necessarily have to call it a price ceiling at this point, and just say, look, people need bread or people need food um, to, to live. So let's say we make that food super cheap. We make it 25 cents, say a quarter for a pound, okay. just about a loaf of bread. And hey, would you support this policy? Now, some good intention students may say, yeah, that'd be great. Get some cheap food just to, to people. Some other people may say no for a variety of reasons. You just sort of want to start to talk it through, you know, maybe do a show of hands who wants to support it and then say, all right, let's say we implement this policy. Let's think through the ramifications. Is there going to be more bread produced or less bread produced? Let the students talk. Now, theoretically, they should get that there'll be less bread. Now that bread is cheaper, producers have less incentive to produce that bread. So we have less bread. Okay. And then go to this slide and say, okay, so now that we have less bread, how do we decide who gets it? There's going to be one, there's going to be more people that want bread than there's bread. So how do we decide who gets it? Students may have a variety of answers here. Okay. All right. We're just going to wait in line. We're going to figure out who needs it the most, maybe a popular one. You want to go with the, with the lining up first, because that's what the next uh, slide says. So let's say we say first come, you know, first serve, whoever gets there first gets the bread. All right. Then we're going to have these lines. That's going to create a huge waste of time. Um, then you can tell your students, you know, in the old Soviet Union, they used to have price controls on all their foods. And so they would have these crazy lines. We have this quote about people waiting in super long lines just for cabbage. And so, all right, this doesn't seem like a good outcome or a good way to do it. So then maybe you want to go to, all right, we're going to have an official decide who needs the bread the most. All right. But then this can be very costly. There's got to be forms that people fill out to kind of prove they're the most needy. How do we actually know they're the most needy? You know, maybe the official is going to give it to their friends. It's just also not um, ideal. Then you want to go further and say, what are some other effects? All right, now we have this, uh, you know, price cap on bread. You can only charge a quarter. Um, do we think we're going to get focaccia? You like some focaccia bread? You want to get some fancy bread? Of course not. You know, there's no going to be, there's not going to be these high quality, high variety um, breads anymore. Another potential consequence. All right, I got the bread. Somehow I got the bread. I waited in the line. I paid a quarter. I got this bread. People want to pay more for it. So maybe I start an underground market where I'm uh, dealing bread. Again, underground markets essentially uh, um, are often associated with crime. So this is also not ideal. Right? And so we hear, we set we see sort of talking through with the students all these unintended consequences of this well-intentioned policy of trying to get uh, you know low-income indiv individuals cheap. Food. We're going to have shortages, long lines, rationing, underground markets, lower quality. Then we're going to play this video, which introduces the idea of price ceilings. This is one of my favorite MRU videos. It has a nice graph showing that price ceiling, which we're going to do in a second. Um, it also has this nice story of when this actually happened, a real world example from the United States. And it has some crazy unintended consequences that I won't spoil. Just watch the video. Then we have the video questions. We have questions at 102. Here are the answers. Questions at 149. The answers again. Questions at uh, three. Again, this is just to break up the video, make sure the students are paying attention. Now, post-video discussion, what we're driving at is these price ceilings sort of make the market break down. And all of a sudden, buyers and sellers are not aligned. There's all sorts of possible inefficiencies. And who benefited from the price ceilings? Well, some consumers will benefit because they'll be able to get the goods at um, lower prices. But overall, the whole system is much less efficient. Okay. All right. Then we're going to introduce the graph. So we're going to say, all right, here's our standard supply and demand graph. We put a price ceiling onto it. Now, this is often confusing because ceilings that are high up don't matter. So if you have a price ceiling, and another, another way to... to to use a, another term to use is maximum price. So if we have a maximum price and the maximum price is super high, well, that's not going to affect the market. And again, it's confusing because like ceilings up here don't matter, but the ceilings down here do matter. So just to introduce this, look, 
we put a price ceiling that's above the equilibrium, it's not going to matter. Just as an example, if the government said, hey, you can't charge more than a million dollars for bread, it's not going to affect anything. It's only ceilings that are below the equilibrium that are going to matter. The market wants to go to the equilibrium point, you know, where the curves cross. And then boom, bumps into the ceiling, can't get there. So ceilings below the equilibrium matter. All right. So the price should be here or bumping into the price here. So what's going to happen is people, consumers are going to say, oh, this is a nice low price. We go down the demand curve. They're going to want more. Oh, now bread's cheap. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy some more bread. Producers are going to say, whoa, bread's cheap. We go down the supply curve and the producers are going to want to buy less. So now we have this gap developing between buyers and sellers where buyers want more than producers want to provide. So we have a shortage. And this they should realize um, just from like the our opening our opening example, they should have sort of realized, OK, if we put this this uh, price cap on bread. There will be a shortage. More people want it than want to produce it. All right, let's put some numbers on it. Let's say bread's two dollars and we have 100 that are sold. We put a 75 cent price ceiling Two now 200 people want to buy bread. Only 50 is produced. So we have 150 people that are out of luck. So this is like the first order effect of a price ceiling is you will get a shortage. Okay. Now, in terms of welfare effects, consumer surplus, uh, hopefully you've covered consumer and producer surplus. If not, we have a unit on that coming soon. All right, so consumer surplus will be the top triangle. Producer surplus will be the bottom triangle. I'm assuming um, that you've covered and know consumer and producer surplus. So when the price ceiling comes in, the consumer surplus goes up or potentially goes up because we're adding this bit down here. We're losing this bit over here. Could go up or down actually. And But producer surplus definitely goes down because we're, so we're going from this big triangle down to this smaller triangle. All right, and we're losing this surplus right here which is deadweight loss. These are transactions that would have occurred in a free market, but no longer occur due to the price ceiling. So that's what we lose out as a uh, society. Now, this is an important note. We're basically actually assuming the maximum possible consumer surplus because this part of the demand curve, those are the consumers that value the good the most. We're assuming they get it, but at this low price, you know, all of these consumers also want the good. So it's you know, who's to say who gets it? You know, we don't know the um, allocating mechanism. So maybe some of these low value consumers get it instead of the high value consumers, the consumers that really want it. So we're basically just assuming the best possible consumer surplus. And that is what this note is about. All right. Then we have some interactive practice um, at, uh, the, you know, at, 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 at MRU, we had a bunch of interactive practices. So this is our interactive practice that you can assign to the students, have them do. And then to fill the rest of the time, we have a bunch of practice questions in the student activity sheet. So we built a bunch of price ceiling practice questions. And so the students can practice with those, or you can sign those as homework. Exit ticket, concert tickets. Okay. Concert tickets are almost always below what the market price would be. You know, you can see this in the aftermarket. The prices are always higher usually for, you know, a, a concert people want to go to than the actual, you know, initial price. So how is that like a pricing? Well, it's below the equilibrium. And lo and behold, we have the same phenomenon as a price ceiling. An underground market develops, but also there's a shortage. More people would like to buy these concert tickets than exist at the posted price. So they sell out fast and then everyone's like, ah, I wanted to get the concert ticket. So you could think of concert ticket prices um, as just like a price ceiling. It's a nice little analogizing. All right, that is day one of our unit plan. If you'd like to get it, it should be here. And if not, you can click through to the next walkthrough video.